Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Glenn Anderson from Australia, who's going to talk about uh, flucosides and synergistic combinations for the control of uh, fasciola hepatica. Thanks, Andy. Oh, I will try and leave time for questions. Good morning, everyone. It, um, it's nice to see there's been a few talks already this morning that mentioned liver fluke and the uh, productivity impacts. I think for many years now, liver fluke has actually been a, a parasite that hasn't got the attention that it really should. It's been underdiagnosed, under undertreated, and in a lot of ways, we haven't actually treated the best way we possibly can. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is one of the ways we can do a better job of treatment, and particularly in the face of increasing triclobendazole resistance. And I would like to say first up, it, it gives me great pleasure to be here talking and presenting a paper that has Joe Bore on as a co-author. Um, for those of you who know Joe, he's, he's the king of fluke globally, not just in Australia. And um, he is getting well on in age these days, so he's not very active in the field anymore, but um, I think he finally did get rid of his snail colony in his spare room about three years ago. So in Australia, like many parts of the world, we run on a fairly uh, prescribed treatment regime for liver fluke. As you know, with its complex life cycle, it's quite easy to, to approach it from a strategic point of view. And um, we really base it around three key treatments, with one with an all-stage treatment coming into winter after the uh, rate of infection has gone down. We have another treatment using a delticide coming into the warmer months when we're trying to clean out any of the parasites that have survived the winter. And I should say in Australia, we don't house animals. So our animals are actually in the pasture, potentially being infected all the time of the year. But in most cases, um, as we see here, the temperature drops enough that the snails become inactive and the infection rate goes down. So we clean them out again, coming into the warm months, and then potentially, if required, we have a treatment mid-summer to give the animals a clean out and minimise the impact on the animals. But the most important treatment out of any of those three is, of course, this, this treatment coming into winter, where we want to use an all-stage treatment that cleans the animals out, gives them the, the best possible start across the winter period when, as in our case, they're out poor quality pasture, and we want to make sure they get through winter in the best possible condition they can. So, as we all know, we've had triclobendazole in our arsenal for treatment for quite some years, and it has been a very effective drug. And that's one of the reasons why I think fluke control has not got as much attention as it otherwise uh, might have done, because we have had such a good product. And traditionally, oral delivery of that. Uh, in Australia, at least, uh, some years ago now, we had porons into the market, triclobendazole porons, uh, reasonably popular in some parts of, of uh, our production systems because of the convenience. And more recently, we've also had some synergised products come into the market. And this really has uh, been on the basis of the work done by Joe uh, sort of 20, 25 years ago, where he looked at a number of different combinations and showed that when you do put two flucosides together, you can get a truly synergistic effect rather than just an additional one. First of those into the market was a triclobendazole oxfendazole combination. Um, as you would expect, with triclobendazole being such a good active on its own, you see only a marginal increase in terms of the efficacy that's really showing up at the, the very early stages of the parasite. The other one that we've introduced more recently is a nitroxinal clausulon combination, and that is very easy to show the synergy because, as you know, nitroxinal will kill adults and some of the late immatures. Clausulon by itself will only kill adults. You put the two together and you actually get all three stages with efficacy greater than triclobendazole. So we now in Australia have both of those combinations in the marketplace. And as I say, that when you see the differences in efficacy, they really show up in two places. One is against the very young flukes. In general, apart from diamphenotide, all flucosides do a poorer job the younger the fluke is. So when we look at the very early flukes, that's where we pick up the differences. The other place we see it is against resistant strains. So some data here from quite a lot of different studies throughout the years, and you'll see triclobendazole 
given in its normal oral form uh, against two week olds. So in most cases, for registration purposes, we're testing against four week old early immatures to get an early immature claim for a, a flucoside. Going earlier to the two week old stage is where we start to see the variability. And you can see in some cases, the straight triclobendazole has performed reasonably poorly against those two week olds, whereas the combination consistently gives us at least 95%. And this is some work that Joe did many years ago now, but which I think really neatly illustrates the importance of those very early stages, where he showed that, in fact, by removing the flukes at one to two week old stage, you actually get more of a benefit in that change from one to two weeks to four to six weeks than you do from the four week through to the adults. So obviously, as we all know, major damage in the liver from those migratory very early stages. If you can knock those out, you're going to have a really good uh, productivity impact. So the theory then flows that if you're doing a better job with the synergized flucosides on those very early stages, you should get a productivity impact. The question we wanted to answer was, when you get to the field, outside of those very well-controlled studies where you, know, you have animals that are very tightly controlled, you have point infections rather than trickle infections, do you actually translate that into productivity benefits in the real world? So study one, uh, this was in the Southern Tablelands of New South Wales, using uh, Angus heifers about nine months old, and you'll see the animals up there, they were in fact stud animals, so, uh, well, apart from the black baldy there, which obviously <laughs> somehow snuck into the mix, uh, but stud animals, so they were quite a nice line of, of even cattle. We had 20 per treatment group, and the three treatment groups uh, were used. And I must say, generally in these sorts of studies, we use the farmer's standard practice as one of the treatment groups. Uh, so in this case, uh, they had traditionally used a straight triclobendazole oral and a, an ML poron. So in this case, we added treatment groups where we had the synergized triclobendazole product and we also added another group where we use a long-acting moxidectin injection. And part of the reason for that was to look at the comparative impact of flute control versus improved roundworm control. So if we look at the egg counts, you'll see both of the products did a pretty good job of cleaning the animals out. Uh, they've obviously gone back to a pasture that hasn't had high contamination rates because they haven't even started uh, uh, releasing fluke eggs by day 135. So that was quite good all around. But then if we actually look at the live weight gains, you'll see throughout from, from very early right through to the end of the study at day 135, we see differences between the straight triclobendazole and the synergized form. Um, incredibly, you know, the, the extra Roundworm activity in this case gave an even greater benefit, uh, but clearly looking at the impact of the flute control in these two groups here, we've got an extra eight kilos over that 135 days. So there clearly is an impact from getting better control of those very early stages. Now, as I say, we've had triclobendazole porons in Australia for six or seven years now, and the problem with the porons is that they're quite variable uh, throughout the year, dependent on the coat condition of the animal. And interestingly enough, these two products, uh, one is a product from MSD called Sovereign, uh, one is a product now um, under the control of Merrill called Genesis Ultra. And despite the data here from this study showing that if anything, Sovereign was doing a better job than the Genesis Ultra, the Genesis Ultra managed to get a claim for all three stages of fluke and the sovereign didn't. It only got an adult control claim. And that was put down to when the, what time of year the studies were done. And this, this piece of work actually showed that quite clearly. So coming into winter when the animals have got a winter coat, the efficacy of the poron is much reduced. So if anything, we're likely to see the porons doing a much poorer job than the old triclobendazole. Uh, so case study two, this was in northern New South Wales, and it... Uh, involved a mixed breed and mixed sex group of wieners. They were Brahmin type cross animals, so it took out some of the influence of the coat condition to minimise that impact. 
But again, wieners, 22 per group. We had the Genesis Ultra Poron, which is the most popular poron in the market. We had the Synergize Triclobendazole, and in this case, we also included the Synergize Nitroxanol plus Clausulon, as well as the, the long-acting Moxidectin group. And in this case, you'll see that, uh, in fact, we were seeing eggs uh, coming out of the animals at day 71, so the poron, in fact, didn't even clean the animals out, let alone um, keep them free for any length of time. Uh, the other groups we see flukes have reinfected after the treatment in one case, but uh, have, they've stayed clean in the others. And in weight gains, again, we seem to see a similar pattern as the last one. Uh, not sure why this anomaly, I've never been able to account for that anomaly at day 34, but if you look through the other two time points, again, we see quite a clear pattern where the straight triclobendazole is underperforming compared to the Synergize, and the long-acting roundworm product was giving it a benefit as well. The clear difference in this case was, in fact, we got a much better uh, result from the flute control than we did from the extra roundworm control. So, triclobendazole resistant, entering the picture all over the world. So I recommend if you haven't seen this paper, go and have a look at it. It's a good snapshot of where things stand at the moment. I'm not just recommending that because I'm one of the co-authors, but uh, it, is, it is a good snapshot of where things stand. And it's uh, nice to be in a place of the world where there's lots of flukes. So um, coming from one fluke area to another, it's, uh, it's always good. But uh, if we look at triclobendazole, um, so those of you working in the fluke area um, might recognise this, this name, Numbugger. Um, it's, this is, is the strain that we actually isolated that now quite a lot of genetic work has been done around uh, resistant, uh, that resistant strain. And in this case, we were basically doing a faecal egg count reduction study. And we had a control group, obviously, that received no treatment. We had the straight triclobendazole, the synergized triclobendazole, and the synergized nitroxenol clausulon. And the results basically were that uh, the control group we saw say very similar. Straight triclobendazole, we did see the flutes cleaned out of some animals, but not very many, and still quite high egg counts. The synergized form of triclobendazole cleaned out more of the animals and the egg counts were reduced quite significantly. And the nitroxenol clausulon combination, uh, I found one egg in one animal. So that was essentially almost completely cleaned out. So we can see there's quite a significant difference there between the straight triclobendazole and the synergized triclobendazole. All right, so just to finish up. Um, so clearly in the field as well in our, as in our well-controlled studies, the synergistic flucosides do do a better job. That can translate to productivity benefits for the producer, but it also means we've got tools to slow down the onset of triclobendazole resistance. So you know, as we understand with, with head selection for resistance, we want to use the most efficacious product we possibly can. In this case, if you're going to use triclobendazole, you're better off using the synergized form. But it also means we've got um, the nitroxenol and clausulon combination there that will do an equivalent job to triclobendazole. We can rest the triclobendazole. And in those unfortunate cases where triclobendazole resistance is already present, we can overcome that resistance with an equally efficacious product. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Glenn. We You've left one minute for one question, if uh, anyone has a burning one, before we go on to the next, the final talk. Any questions? Yeah, one at the front, right at the front here, please. Thank you. So you showed the potential of um, combinations to overcome problems of resistance. What about situations, so you are working in Australia, what about, are, is there any likelihood that these combinations can become available in other parts of the world, like Europe or? 
<laughs> that's a very good question. It's already available in, in several countries in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the question about Europe is a complex one because, as you would know, um, Europe traditionally has been resistant to uh, using combination products and, and registering combination products. So um, I've got Clancy Rose there, who's our, our global product manager for that product. He might be able to fill you in a bit, bit more afterwards. But I think certainly because there's a true synergism here, there is an argument for registration of the product in Europe. Uh, but it might be a battle. Good. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. Okay.